Good day to all, and thank you for joining us for this very special conversation. We're coming together today after a screening of Fantastic Fungi, which played at the Sanctuary in October, and many of you were in attendance for this mind-blowing, consciousness-shifting film that takes us on an immersive journey through time and scale into the magical earth beneath our feet, an underground network that can heal and save our planet. Joining us today, we have two very, very special people. Angel Deer is a medicine man, shamanic practitioner, sound healer, and shamanic Reiki master. He's been working with plant medicine for over 10 years and runs the Sanctuary, a shamanic healing center in the Catskills near New York City. The Oklavea Native American Church, I hope I said that right, has <laughs> recognized the Sanctuary New York as one of its official branches. Angel also runs retreats and a shamanic school here in the U.S. as well as Peru. And by his side, we have the director of the film Fantastic Fungi, Louis Schwartzberg. Louis is an award-winning cinematographer, director, and producer whose notable career spans more than four decades, providing breathtaking imagery using his time-lapse, high-speed, and macro cinematography techniques. And in his latest film, Fantastic Fungi, through the eyes of renowned scientists and mycologists like Paul Stamets, best-selling authors Michael Pollan, Eugenia Bone, Andrew Wow, and others, we become aware of the beauty, intelligence, and solutions the Fungi Kingdom offers us in response to some of our most pressing medical, therapeutic, and environmental challenges. For those attending this discussion in the audience, please feel free to type in your questions or comments just to say hello in the Q&A area of the screen as well as the chat area. And I will do my best to monitor these and we'll save time at the end of this conversation to get through as many of your questions as possible. So with that, I'd like to be quiet and turn it over to Angel and Louis. Thank you. Thank Great. you so much, Greta. Yes, very nice meeting you, Louis. Uh, we had such an amazing experience. I think it was three weeks ago, uh, watching your movie, and we had a full full attendance that day. We were like 40, 50 people uh, that came to see uh, the movie, and uh, you know, I'm excited we can uh, we can be with you today because um, I'm a huge fan of Mushroom, and uh, I think it's one it's one of the most beautiful uh, documentary movie that I've ever seen uh, on the on the phone guys. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to dive right in, you know, but one of the first question I want to ask you, Louis, is what inspired you to, to do this movie and to specifically uh, do the, the fungi uh, world on this movie? Well, I think it's been a lifelong journey for me to um, go down the path of making a film about fungi uh, because I started off filming um, time-lapse flowers. When I graduated from UCLA, I, I couldn't afford to shoot a lot of film, but I was able to kind of retrofit these old movie cameras that shot animation, you know, one frame at a time, take them outdoors. And then I started to film like time-lapse shadows and sunrises, and fog and clouds and, and flowers. And when I started filming flowers, um, that turned me on to this whole idea of trying to understand pollination, the intersection between the animal world, the plant world. And as you know, um, you know, the flower turns into fruits, nuts, vegetables, berries, the healthy food we need to eat. Without the intersection between the animal world and the plant world, with bees in particular, uh, we'd have no food. We wouldn't have any of the healthy food we need. And then you ask the bigger question, um, well, what do plants need? Well, they need sunlight, they need water, they need soil. Where does soil come from? So it comes from the largest organism on the planet. Um, they found one in Oregon, it's 2,000 acres. And, um, you know, fungi can break down organic matter to create soil. Most people don't know that. So um, it's been like a, a journey uh, over 40 years where I'm just trying to unveil the mystery of life. I'm just asking a bigger question over and over, you know? So that's where, that's why I made the film about mushrooms, not on mushrooms. If I was on mushrooms, it would have taken probably a lot less time. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, 
but I imagine, you know, I mean, some of the, the sequence and uh, without being too technical, but some of the sequence seems like you've been spending a year in the forest waiting for one mushroom to pop out somewhere. And then somewhere else, I mean, there's uh, fungi from all over the world in, in your movie. And I was quite fascinated by the, the quality of the image, but also, uh, I guess, the process to get to this fungi, because, you know, it's always a mystery. I mean, I love going for uh, mushroom hunting and trying to find them. I have my spots here in the forest and on the land of the sanctuary where I know some of them, where they're coming up or when they're coming up, but they're quite mysterious. They're not always there and they're not always there at the same time. So I'm kind of wondering a little bit what's the difficulty to kind of find them and also be there when those uh, mystery of this mystery of them blooming out happen. Yeah. Well, what's great is that even someone who's like an expert like you assumed that I shot most of those outdoors. The reality is we shoot them indoors. I work with my, you know, my colleagues, and we have to shoot them indoors because you can't leave a camera outside for a month. Uh, otherwise, it'll, someone will steal it. Or you have the, very, the variation of light, it flickers. Uh, we have to shoot you know, day to night, bugs. Uh, lots of variables. So we create little mini sets in interior that we're able to control 100%. And with you know the help of people who are experts, we, we start so that I know where the mushroom is going to pop up. I'm able to like create a, a miniature environment indoors. And then we intercut it with wide shots of the forest. And it works because um, then you just assume it's all outdoors. Got it. Okay, because I was like, wow, this is quite amazing. But even that seems to me quite remarkable given, uh, you know, each mushroom has its own environment and in its yeah. own temperature and light and all of that. And uh, I'm guessing for some of them, it was probably really difficult to film a blooming of them or to feel uh, how they're coming out, no? Yeah, it was, it was definitely challenging. It, you certainly have a failure rate, maybe one out of five work. And then we licensed a couple of exotic ones from places all around the world where we would never be able to get a specimen. Mm -hmm. Got it. So in, in that world of mushroom, you know, one of the things that you outline in the, in the movie, which I think was interesting, is that they're not really a plant and they're not really an animal. They're kind of this uh, in-between organism. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, quite, they look quite different, obviously, from the rest of the forest, for the rest of the natural world. Uh, to me, I always found that they look a little bit alien, like they are from somewhere else. That's always been my, my feeling. They really stand out as uh, something uh, very, uh, very different there. Uh, but uh, is there something uh, in them when you were filming and when you were... I guess spend you know a year or two years I don't know how long you spent filming them that already changed for you in terms of your understanding of them uh, compared to maybe what you knew about them. I mean I guess diving so deep in it or maybe some of the things that are the most remarkable that you really didn't expect from doing that movie. Well, no, I, I think I discovered a lot of things that I did not know when I started it. I mean, for example, one big one was the fact that it could be the greatest natural solution for climate change the whole idea that you know co2 uh, goes into the pore of the leaf which i visualized with one continuous kind of animation shot and that the carbon goes down the trunk of the tree through the roots and into the mycelium network 70 percent of the carbon goes underground well, that's the greatest natural solution for climate change by being able to sequester the carbon and putting it back in the ground where we have dug it up and burned it with coal and you know fossil fuels and oil. So I, I never knew that. I'm an environmentalist uh, for many years. You know, very active making environmental films. I didn't know that. Um, the other great you know aha moment for me too is the whole idea of the mother tree. The fact that a mother tree can share nutrients with its kin, and and that's how ecosystems can flourish by being able to share nutrients on the ground. They also use the mycelium like an underground internet, the wood wide web, where they can warn other trees, smaller trees, if there's a pest or some disease that's attacking the forest. The fact that there's a communication system under the ground, I found that to be remarkable. And I think what we're trying to do with the screenings 
is bringing what's below the ground, above the ground. This idea that there's a shared economy under the ground, not based on greed, where ecosystems can flourish. That's why we're doing these live events, so people can come together, connect, and almost be a mirror to the mycelial network. Yes, and I, and I really appreciate that, given, you know, we're at a time of great change at the moment in our communities, in our environment, uh, with the changing climates, uh, with communities that are, you know, uh, struggling in many parts of the country or many parts of the world, and people are trying to connect. And I feel like this rebirth or this revival of the mushroom world that you show in your movie through construction materials, through many ways the mushroom are coming into our life at the moment. It's kind of them trying to come to help us. And, you know, in shamanic work, we always say, or, you know, in herbalism, we say, oh, well, when, when you're sick or when you need a plant, that plant will show up. Yeah. It will show up in your garden maybe six months or a year before the disease show up. And uh, mushroom are a huge part of the, yeah, the medicine we, we use in shamanic work. So I'm wondering if you feel that beyond obviously talking about the myceliums and all of that, that you're, the movie to me felt like a big call for humanity and for our community to kind of look at each other in a different way, to connect in a different way. I mean, I, I really love what you have on your website about that. Can you tell me a little bit about, about that? Because I feel it's not just yeah. a documentary. I mean, you're trying to put a movement yeah. out there, if I understand. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But I think the film is a catalyst for a cultural movement that is you know, sprouting up everywhere. And they feel that you know, the mushrooms are a portal really into nature's intelligence. And the end result, I think, of watching the movie is really about shifting consciousness and elevating consciousness. Um, and, and I think what's powerful about the film, especially, is the fact that for those communities that might be scared about shamanic medicine or anything that sounds a little bit like Eastern religion, um, they think they're just showing up to see a documentary about mushrooms. But at the end, the conversations are about love, about connection, about how do we live in harmony with nature, how do we reconnect with ourselves? We are nature. And how do we reconnect with each other? You know, I think that's the message that the mushrooms are trying to make us awaken to in this particular time of breakdown and breakthrough. Breakdown in terms of, you know, fossil fuel economy, political and social structures, the healthcare system. I mean, all these things are, they're, they're maybe not fixable. It's like we need a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. And I think that the mushrooms are kind of indicating to us that this is a time for change. And we need to be able to have new ideas. You know, the, the, the mycelium, they're like, they're like edge runners. You know, on the, they got these edge runners that go out and they're trying to figure out how do I partner with you? How do I engage with you? Or how do I eat you? Um, but, what but they always have to invent a new chemical you know, interaction with the environment that they're touching. So it's not a static thing. They're always learning how to evolve. And I think that's what we need to do as well, is to constantly be, you know, learning how to adapt to our environment. Now that we have this, you know, environmental degradation caused by man, we, what the film offers is solutions and hope. You know, we can, we need to adapt and we can do it. We just have to, um, kind of uh, understand nature's intelligence and, and help scale it to do it on maybe on a much faster way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the mushroom are clearly showing us the way in terms of how to connect because they are really the king of connection, I guess. Yes, uh, they are. You know, in, in, the, in the plant and animal world, they really are in partnership, like you just said. So one of the things that really fascinate me about them is their capacity to uh, work on the human brain. Uh, especially when it comes to a medicinal mushroom or psychoactive mushrooms. Uh, and I always find it quite intriguing that the way they're working, I mean, now there's a lot of study on, on depression or PTSD and, and other, I would say, more brain uh, disease or brain issues that our society is facing at the moment or the collective is facing. Uh, and when I look at a 
uh, fungi, the microsome under the ground, it looks a lot like neurons to me. You know, yeah. it looks a lot like the brain neurons. Sure. And it's quite interesting to me that somehow when people take those mushrooms, we kind of rewire the brain, you know, kind of destroy old patterns that are not serving us anymore, create new pathways in the brain that are more filled with compassion, with love, with hope, with joy, and all of that. Um, and um, I'm wondering, you know, what's your, what's your experience with that? Did you have any experience with mushroom before? Uh, you know, more on the psychoactive side, on the healing side, let's say, you know, in general, is it something that was part of uh, kind of the, the, because I feel the, the movie talks a lot about that. I mean, it talks about many things, but it's a big part of it. So what, what's your take on that? Sure. Well, I would say that um, it, it, it changed my life when I had psychedelic experiences when I was in college. I think it definitely opened me up to a spiritual experience that has certainly influenced my filmmaking. I mean, maybe that's why I film, you know, uh, I take people on journeys through time and scale. You know, I, I speed up, you know, time or slow time down or do micro macro because I'm trying to show you a reality that you can't see, but it's real, right? By, by showing you a different perspective. And what that does is it opens up your worldview and when that happens, I think you become more compassionate and more understanding and more grateful. Um, we, we, we see things in a very, very narrow field of view. And the psychedelics, I think, are like um, putting on reading glasses or, or using a telescope or a microscope to be able to see what is real just beyond the limitations of the naked eye, for example. You know? So, mm -hmm. um, so, so the film itself is an immersive experience. And a lot of people, I think, probably feel even like they're going on a journey, even watching the movie, because I am altering time and scale. And that is similar to the experience you have when you have you know, a sacred medicine experience where you're altering time and scale. I mean, what, what happens is you get to that point at all you know, meditative practices, you know, want to get to, which is being in the moment, being present, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the time-lapse imagery does that by, you know, you get this kind of, oh my God, experience, and you're, you're looking at something and the brain goes, well, I don't know, is it real or it's not real? It's not animation, it's real. But to see mushrooms grow, to see flowers opening, you're, you're experiencing life from their point of view. And maybe that's what the plant medicines and mushrooms do. They're just showing life to you from their point of view. And when you think about it, all plant life, all fungal, uh, they, they communicate through chemistry. That's how they speak to each other. It's only humans that develop language. And so how would the mushrooms speak to you? They're not gonna speak to us in English or French or German. They're gonna to speak to us through chemistry. And it can't be by chance they came up with a molecule that is a perfect fit in the receptor of the brain that enables different parts of the brain to engage, to be able to lose your ego, to be able to be in the moment, to be able to feel love. That is not an accident, in my opinion. I think there's intention there. And what the mushrooms are doing, I think they're opening us up to reconnect with nature and reconnect with ourselves and each other. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree uh, with you, Louis. And, uh, you know, what's fascinated me on, on the medicine side is that many mushrooms have been used for very long time, thousands and thousands of years in traditional medicine, you know, Eastern Chinese medicine, especially, and, you know, even in Europe, you know, and, and, Many traditions uh, have been using mushroom, you know, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia. So it's something that's in the, in the common knowledge, you know, for healing sometimes even things like cancer or, you know, immune system that's deficient. And, and I find it quite interesting, you know, in the world of today with all the toxic pollutants that there is, you know, in nature and as a reflection in our bodies. Um, that there's not much more use uh, of those mushrooms, which we know that's what they do. You know, there's proven literacy around that. And obviously there is now new research that's happening uh, with those microfungi and, and, and all those different type of mushroom. 
do you feel that one of the reason they're not that commonly used i mean you know we know about shaga maybe we know about raishi you know you know me about a few others but do you think there is, the reason is really due to i would say the western way of looking at medicine and the pharmaceutical industry and the fact that you know i always often think of that mushroom aqua chip you know if you want to do a treatment from someone under depression or cancer the cost of a treatment and using plants uh, is much much cheaper than you know getting you know a treatment in the western way yeah. so do you think it's the main reason that they are still quite obscure or do you think it's just also because of who they are I mean, the fact that they are quite difficult to find that there's many people think that most of them are very dangerous and you can die if you eat the wrong one so right. what, what do you think of that of their yeah I mean, as you said, like, you know, indigenous cultures have been using it for tens of thousands of years as a rite of passage, you know, that you would do it maybe once or twice in your life, not as a party drug, but as a way to, you know, have a spiritual experience, your own personal vision quest. And I think that has a lot of value. What happened, I think, certainly in, in Western society, and we talk about it only briefly in a movie, but, um, you know, Richard Nixon declared war on drugs. They, they labeled mushrooms and LSD, which was at the forefront of psychological research at Stanford and Harvard, with great results, helping people with addiction to alcohol, tobacco, uh, depression. And then it all got shut down because it was a political move by Richard Nixon to um, you know, uh, combat his political enemies, people who were like anti-war protesters people of color, uh, because what, what the mushrooms have in common and, and with, with people like that, they're changers. They're, they're, they're always going to be rebellious. They're going to challenge the status quo, which is a healthy thing. That's where progress comes from. Um, there is no solid like religion around mushrooms or any sacred medicine. They're always asking questions. They're always asking you to explore. There's no rigid Bible for any of this stuff, right? And so they're, they're, it's great that they're always going to be, you know, challenging. Um, and, in that, and, and because of that, because they're a threat to the status quo, they're a threat to government. They're a threat to organized religion, you know? They're, they're um, you know, some people want to have all the answers, and then there are others that, see life as the journey to to find the answers you know and maybe you never get to it i mean when they asked einstein his definition of god he said it was a sense of wonder so um i think it's great that the mushrooms you know enable you to go on that journey um some people are scared of that idea that there there is no concrete answer for everything in the universe <laughs> and some people can embrace the mystery fall in love with that mystery as a, a life of learning and the journey we're all on together so um you know so i, I guess in western society it just became a little bit more materialistic and more mechanistic more mechanistic where we all have all the answers science went in that direction as well where everything has to be you know very didactic and um, i think we need to bring a little bit of that sense of wonder back into science and or um, spiritual practices yeah it feels to me you know when when you look at a system today that has promised us to have all the answers and all the solutions especially with the rise of science and technology in the last 40 or 50 years and uh, very you know tight structures of you know belief system especially not just through religions but cultures and the western way of seeing things and we're really seeing today the limits of that way of thinking of those mm -hmm. behaviors. I mean, we, this is clearly, clearly a massive impact uh, on the planet and um, also an impact on communities and impact on people. Uh, you know, even if you're not really, some people are maybe not that concerned, maybe by the forest uh, or by Greenland or uh, the polar bear or things like that, but there's a direct impact mm -hmm. in our communities of that system today. Oh. Um, and I like what you say about the idea that mushrooms are trying to shake that up 
and to show yeah. new possibility and maybe to destroy because that's what they do too you know they kind of destroy something so they can regrow from new right. from 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 death from things that are dead and they can rebuild something completely different of that and bring new life and bring new hope out of that you know this this period you know we're living now it's like breakdown and breakthrough a lot of these systems need to break down just like in, in the forest and then they have to be um uh, built you know we have all this incredible technology now i'm here at in at the del coronado it's exponential medicine by singularity university and all this incredible stuff is happening with like robots and ai and uh technology that can you know investigate everything about your body you know bit biofeedback brain waves i mean it's kind of it's exciting to be seeing that even in medicine we're discovering new ways of understanding the body which we had no idea about we're really at, at the beginning frontier of all of that so again i think that it's healthy to have new systems i mean maybe eventually there won't even be doctors you go to you know everything will be an app on your phone because it's going to be measuring all your vital signs and and more energy has to go into preventative you know health care instead of you know treating people that are sick because they went down the path of, uh, of self-destruction with their diet or uh, lifestyle or environmental degradation. We got to change the whole thing. And, and who knows if even the healthcare system can be changed or whether we just got to start from scratch and build something brand new. In any event, we need to have that conversation because it's clear what is not working right now. And we have all the tools and technology and know how to make a change. We just need to have a shift of consciousness to make to make that behavioral change occur. And maybe that's what the mushrooms are doing. They're inspiring us to be the changers. Yeah, and one of you know the things that comes up when you when you're sharing that is I wonder if we are mature enough uh, somehow to be ready to be taught by the natural world and by mushroom. And maybe because we are, you know, very focused on technology and we, we think, you know, all the answers to from the climate crisis to, you know, community, community crisis to healthcare and all of that will come from the next big invention, the next big technology revolutions, which is true. You know, obviously antibiotic came, but, you know, but somehow <laughs> antibiotics, you know, were also from the natural world. So there, there has been big revolution. Obviously, our way of life has changed a lot and we have a much easier we have lies to a certain degree than our ancestors. Um, and that could be arguable, even that I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, yeah. But uh, do you think we are ready today? I feel like, you know, there's so much money very often you see to launch a new satellite program to maybe conquer a new planet, to invest in AI, to, you know, find the new app that's going to reconnect people when we know in the first place, technology has really disconnected people. Are we, are we ready to sit in the forest and listen to a yeah. mushroom? <laughs> I think that the question really is, it's not whether we're ready or not. I don't think we have a choice mm -hmm. because of the, you know, environmental degradation and the, the time bomb of climate change. I mean, if we don't, according to 350.org, you know, which measures the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, we really have 10 years to, to really dramatically turn it around because already we're past the tipping point and then it's just a matter of how much suffering will there be. So there is a, there is a time clock right now that is ticking and we have to do something right now. And you see that there's a movement with young people across the planet that are protesting and demonstrating saying their future is at risk. So um, now is the time and then maybe the mushrooms are really, you know, bringing together thought leaders, uh, environmentalists to really focus on this issue at this critical moment in time. Um, this is, we can't wait for a couple of generations to eventually evolve. That's the way it's always happened in the past. I don't think we've ever had a time in human history where it's either now or never. And, I, and again, I don't want to be like a dooms, you know, person and, you know, doom and gloom, but that is a reality. But I'm, I think we can roll up our sleeves and do something about it. And, and the mushrooms and the movie offer a lot of solutions of what we can all do. And just for example, permaculture, no-till you know, farming, let's stop using pesticides, um, 
you know, let things decompose and rot your garden, support your organic farmer, grow organic food. These are all things you can do in your backyard. So there is a call to action. And if we all, I think, start to make move in the right direction, we can turn it around. Yes, so Greta was asking a question, you know, uh, how, how will this affect your filmmaking and future projects? Obviously, you know, you've always been involved in environmental projects, you know, this movie is still, you know, uh, playing through the country, and I think now at the moment it's on the West Coast, I think, or something like that. Uh, but does this, doing this, all this research and this filming on the mushroom, what did the mushroom tell you, told you about your own life, your own past as a filmmaker, and how this is impacting really how you see things. Are you just, you know, you have maybe a four or five projects in your mind or in your heart for many years that you want to outline out there, but is this something shifting? And maybe with this urgency also that you mentioned. Yeah. I think that like one thing I didn't, you know, certainly expect is like how I was gonna end the movie was really a giant statement about the fact that communities survive better than individuals. And um, mm -hmm. and that's why we're doing these theatrical events prior to putting it on a streaming platform where people would be potentially watching it alone on a digital device. Again, disconnection from each other. Mm -hmm. So this idea of connection, I think, is resonating with me deeply. And I think that you know there, there's a film project I've been you know, you know working on for a while about wonder and gratitude. And when you connect to nature and each other, I think that engenders gratitude. And I think it puts you into the moment. And I want to do a deep dive into what is wonder. I mean, for me, wonder is this magical intersection between art, science, and technology. It seems like it's the space we all want to get to in order to feel bliss. And um, so, it, you know, it, it's kind of like another, my kids always, you know, uh, make fun of me. God, Louie, you always want to tell these big stories, like, you know, what is life? <laughs> and then now I want to do something like, what is wonder? But I think that might be my next deep dive. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Really, really love that. Uh, yeah, by the way, I wanted to mention for anyone on the call, if you want to ask questions to, to Louis or myself, you know, please, please just jump in. Um, I just want to come back uh, to the point on uh, on medicine and sacred medicine uh, because it's a big one that you touch upon uh, in the in the movie and there has been you know many cities at least and sometimes some states that have started to decriminalize uh, those sacred medicine and it seems that to me that there is a movement. I mean, Chicago just announced you know a few weeks ago I think uh, decriminalizing all plant medicine, not just mushroom. Uh, and it feels to me that it's it's quite interesting that this is happening at the moment, you know, and there's something really a big push around it. And, you know, cities like Chicago, like the third city in the U.S., you know, we're not just talking a small community in Oregon. Uh, and um, do, do you feel that uh, this is part of what's going to make the, the mushroom really come and be more prominent out there? Or do you feel it's more going to come through some of the other application like pollution control or building materials I and mean, you give some example there i think some people now have found some mushroom that are able to digest plastic uh, yeah. which is a great hope potentially for cleaning our rivers and our yeah. soils and our oceans um, so what's your what's your view around that you know where do you think or maybe all the people you met where do you feel there's really a big, yeah. a big potential there well i think that for um, there's a giant potential for decriminalization of these sacred medicines, particularly with young people, because um, the younger generation didn't get the propaganda and misinformation that my generation grew up with. Um, even though I ignored it, um, it, it was still, you know, scary to hear government reports that if you took psychedelics, you know, you go, you create schizophrenia, it would destroy your chromosomes you know, all this like fear and you jump off a building. And a lot of people my age, after watching the movie, um, still have that fear. And now they're going, wow, where can I, where can I have like a um, additional spiritual experience? So young people, and I've seen it definitely at Burning Man and definitely at um, Lightning in a Bottle, these giant, you know, events that are primarily, you know, with, with young people, 
they're they're very open minded to the whole thing, and it's really just part of their culture. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley right now. I mean, people are microdosing. Um, it's normal to go to work with microdosing. It's it's common. It it's being used to develop you know better software, better engineering tools. Um, everybody wants to be the next Steve Jobs, who was very influenced by psychedelics. So it's kind of weird in a way that psychedelics are being used to make money, but that's something that I'm observing. It's real, you know. And um, and you look at like look how fast uh, cannabis became uh, not only decriminalized but legalized even for recreational use. I mean, I live in L.A. I drive down Ventura Boulevard. Every street corner has a giant billboard, you know, for uh, you know. Uh, for marijuana and cannabis. Um, so sometimes when the timing is right in history, things move quicker than even people like us would imagine. When President Obama was elected president, he was against gay marriage. When he left eight years later, the Republicans were for gay marriage. That is something nobody expected to occur in such a short time frame. So um, if you look at history, when, when things are ripe, to happen and it kind of is interesting when you have this kind of really dark dark side that's happening in our politics right now it always has a counterbalance of breakthrough when when uh, richard nixon made the war on drugs in 1970 that spawned earth day the largest protests that ever happened in america and also the movements for for women and people of color all came out of this, like, you know, resistance. So, you know, for it's cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So all this dark news we're getting right now based on fear and anxiety, there is a counterbalance that I think has to happen that I'm trying to help happen with the movie, which is getting people to fall in love with beauty. Because if you fall in love with it, you'll protect it. Mm -hmm. The beauty way, as Native American, you know, uh, talked about. Um, uh, well, thank you so much, Riju. I wanted to wrap up with just uh, one last question in terms of support. You know, how can people really support this or movie? And, you know, I know you still have screening going on. Or even, you know, whatever last words you want to give about what can we do, you know, because it's all about action here. Like you said, you know, I think we all... Uh, like Joanna Macy said, you know, we need hope and hope is through action and coming together. And uh, you're, you're trying to do that beautifully with your, your platform, I would say, around the movie. So what are the things we can do, you know, with this movie or beyond the movie uh, in this next 12 months to really support uh, that you. awakening that we're all craving for? Well, what, what we're doing so far is all, you know, without an ad budget and it's all based on word of mouth. So, you know, I would say for everybody who's listening to certainly tell your friends, um, go to the website, fantasticfunguide.com, and you'll see a, a, there's a schedule of where we're screening the movie. You can also sign up and host the movie. We also have these pillars, uh, calls to action. So whether you're a forager, a chef, an artist, or a mentalist, a medical practitioner, there are, you know, um, groups we can, you know, um, connect with and get involved with. Mm -hmm. But I would just say primarily, um, we just want to create this mycelial network and grow it and let everybody feel that, that there's more of us than we think. Actually, you're out near enough state New York, and my inspiration is the Woodstock movie. You know, before Woodstock, there were a bunch of people with, you know, Peason and Lovin and Haight Ashbury in San Francisco. But when Woodstock happened, it just blew everybody's minds. And 400,000 people showed up on a farm to listen to rock and roll and uh, smoke pot. So that changed the music scene, changed the politics, changed the cultural scene. That was a major breakthrough. And I think the, the reason why is that people kind of looked around and said, oh my God. There are more of us than we think. We're not a tiny little, you know, minority. Um, people started to connect with each other and it became a much bigger movement. Yeah, we're not alone, clearly. So uh, thank you so much, Louis. Uh, Greta, I don't know if you want to say something to close or if you have any questions, but 
Uh, oh, I think it's, it's really rich and we see there's so much more than the mushroom here. <laughs> I just want to thank both of you for coming together for this conversation and listening to it. It was incredibly inspiring. Thank you both. And we will have a recording of this for anyone who wasn't able to attend in this hour. So we'll make sure that all of our communities do get a chance to connect and be a part of the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louis. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.